Good morning, everyone. We'd like to welcome you to the Mesa City Council study session for the morning of Thursday, January the 13th. I'll note that all of our council is present. The first item on our agenda is a presentation uh, to provide direction on the city's competitive workforce initiatives. So we will have, yeah, Terry Overby and Brian welcome. here. So. Good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council Members. My name is Terry Overby and I'm the Human Resources Director. And alongside me, I have Brian Richel, who is the Office of Management and Budget um, Assistant Director. Today, we are here to discuss some of the citywide uh, recruitment and retention challenges that the city is experiencing. Likewise, nationwide, it, it is a, a trend that um, that everyone is experiencing. We're here to also um, share with you some of the uh, graph statistics on that uh, and also share some of the measures that the city has already taken in terms of re recruitment and retention in order to stay competitive in the marketplace and to make some future recommendations. The first chart here that we're showing you is just showing the trend for the citywide vacant positions. So as you can see, we just did a three-year trend here. Starting in 2019, you'll see that the vacant positions for that year were 258. Again, then moving into 2020, we hit COVID times, um, 295 vacancies, and then in 2021, we jumped up to 468 vacant positions for that year. On the flip side, to just describe and go over the citywide turnover rate. So our turnover rate in 2019 was 8.94%. In 2020, it slightly increased to 9.41%. And then in 2021, it jumped to 11.68%. And the turnover rate, the way that we describe that, that, <coughs> that, that does include retirements, resignations, dismissals, and deaths. It's all of the categories. So to counter some of the measures and the challenges that we've had in terms of recruitment, the police department has put together several hiring in incentives in order to be competitive. Many of the other agencies are doing similar things in order to attract candidates. For police officer recruit, we have instituted a $3,500 hiring bonus, a signing bonus. Um, half of that is after 30 days. So they come on, they get half of that. And then after they complete the field training program, approximately 10 10 months down the road, they would get the remainder of that. They're also looking to, to um, offer an incentive, $500 if they, if they hire someone that comes in with a bachelor's degree, $1,000 if they come in with a master's degree. And again, that would be given on completion of the field training program. For lateral, they're offering a $5,000 hiring bonus. Again, $2,500, they're splitting it up, half at the completion of their lateral academy, half at completion of their field training program. And detention officer and detention officer trainee were offering a $2,000 hiring bonus, $1,000 after 30 days, $1,000 after completion of the training program. For Parks and Rec, they have put together some in incentives that are for the upcoming season. Um, one, the first is a certification reimbursement incentive that could be up to $425. So for lifeguards, they have to come in with a lifeguard certification. These are young people that are coming in that cost $200 to get that to even apply for the position. So they are offering a $200 reimbursement for lifeguard. And for the swim lesson instructor, that's a $225 reimbursement. Um, in addition, they are doing a employee referral program. So their, their staff can receive a $150 referral if they refer a staff member, and that can be up to $600. So if they refer four members that get hired on with us, they can get up to $600. They are also offering a $500 retention incentive, and that is basically they are trying to incentivize folks to stay the entire season. So if they make it and they're in good standing and they work the entire season, then they would be eligible for a $500 retention incentive. The water department has also had some challenges. So for their water plant operators, they are offering a $35 
$100 hiring bonus that would be paid at completion of their one-year probation. They are also instituting a $1,000 employee referral bonus to staff that are recommending these new positions at the one and the two level. So the following is just describing some of the recruitment and retention tools that we've already had to put in place to remain competitive in the marketplace. When we're hiring new employees, we've had to hire them higher in the range to remain competitive rather than bringing them in at the, at the minimum or the entry level. We've also had to offer salary adjustments for existing employees in order to counter job offers because we don't want to lose our valuable employees that have that institutional knowledge. We've also had to review salary ranges to address recruitment issues. If we're not getting the applicants for the positions, we've had to to look at some case-by-case -case basis. We've also had to look at private sector data in certain cases with city manager approval to address recruitment issues for certain fields that are losing a, a, a considerable amount of uh, individuals to the private sector. We've had to offer performance awards, additional benefits, you know, things like that to try to remain competitive. So along with the departments, uh, doing the incentives on a citywide salary adjustments. The city has been uh, looking at the past couple of years and trying and staying competitive within the workforce also on a citywide level. So in just to give you a little history and uh, moving forward, in July of 2020, we did a we did the de deferred step pay that was due to uh, the COVID. Not sure what was going to go on with the fiscal year that year, so we deferred it. However, in January of 2021, just last year, the city did a $2,000 one-time gross pay to all full-time employees, along with a 5% market adjustment, so their range, their pay range went up 5%, and did a 3% salary increase for all city employees. Now, Brian, clarify, the 5% adjustment adjustment in the range that is correct so the five percent was adjustment in the range so the range moved up five percent and then all employees to because that what happened was with the employees that are topped out in their range if we did a three percent salary increase they would not be able to benefit so what the city did was they increased all pay ranges five percent and then gave all employees that three percent so with that come july those uh, those employees that were topped out, however, their range moved up. All em employees received up to a 3% pay increase for eligible employees. So if they received a meets on their uh, uh, PAF, their performance appraisal. So what that meant was if you were topped out, the pay, the pay range moved up 5%. They got 3% in January, and then they got the extra 2% in July. The ones that weren't topped out, they could max out at the 3%. Then coming this January, the, uh, which I think has been uh, uh, presented to council, is the $2,000 one-time gross pay for all full-time employees again. Now, what the city is proposing is a 5% market adjustment and a 5% salary increase for all city employees. This would go into effect this January 31st, and employees would see it in their paycheck on February 17th. So, Mayor and Council, this is... I mean, you've seen the reports that have come out this week on inflation, as well as, as Terry was explaining, the challenges we're having with both retention and recruitment. And we've tried to deal with, and you've seen some of the um, specific um, job titles where we've had to take some uh, different measures, but it, we're experiencing it pretty much across the board. And, the, and, the, and also just the mere fact that, you know, what uh, our employees were making six months ago, whatever, a year ago, with inflation, it's, you know, the net results, it's less, right? Less buying power. Um, we just felt like, you know, even though if you look at it, in July, we had a 3% step pay increase for all, for eligible employees, so most employees. The $2,000 they'll receive here next week, two weeks? Two weeks. Two weeks is probably for most employees, an average employee it represents another two and a half, almost 3%. Uh, pay increase, so you add that up, that's 5%. Um, but again, we're just falling behind, you know, or yeah, we're, we continue to see a falling behind. Um, 
because, uh, and Brian could probably speak to this a little bit, but we are also with inflation and uh, because people are paying um, more taxes on retail goods, um, we're also seeing improvement in our collection of revenue. So um, we just, we would propose, and it's our recommendation that um, we move forward with a 5% Adjustment now. This is different than the one. I, that's why I want to be clarifying the last one. This is not. This is not only an adjustment to the range, but it takes everybody up five percent also. Okay, so it's both allowing the ranges to move up, which when we're doing recruitment, will allow us to recruit at a higher salary rate than we currently have today in the range, but also make sure that every employee um, will fill will receive that five percent mid year. Uh, which is we've never since I've been here, we've never done that. But this hasn't we haven't had this kind of inflation <laughs> since I've been here either. Um, and we want to make cl clear, uh, you can see in that last bullet, that um, this is not in lieu of or trying to accelerate what we've already um, budgeted in July. We currently have three percent, but obviously we're going to have to review that even as we go through the budget about whether that adjustment, what that adjustment will be. It's just. And give you the numbers in the forecast, not necessarily saying that's what it will be, but we we would like to recommend that we move forward. Um, well, end of this month, um, a five percent across the board for all employees. So. Thank you. I know Mr. Luna has a question. Hey, Terry. Good when morning. you uh, do you do exit interviews for those employees that decide to go ahead and move to other positions, and are it, and are they going to the private sector, or is the private sector paying them more? Is that is that their incentive to move on? Yes, we do do exit um, interviews. It is a vo on a voluntary basis. I, I, we probably don't get a large percentage of individuals that actually take advantage of it because it is voluntary. Mm -hmm. It is for a variety of reasons. We're seeing them go to the private sector. We're seeing them leave for family reasons. Sometimes mm -hmm. COVID has has changed their family circumstances. Mm -hmm. So we're seeing a variety of reasons mm -hmm. why they're they're leaving mm -hmm. and and moving on. I know. Councilman Luna, I can tell you specifically yeah, on the can, plant operators, right. that was a private sector yes. uh, response uh, because our plant operators, well, with Intel's um, expansion of their fab plants and the semiconductor plant that's going up <clears throat> um, North Phoenix, um, they've been recruiting and they've been staffing up water plant operators also mm -hmm. because they use the, for the cooling of their systems. So we lost, I want to say about four or so, four, five, four <laughs> of our plant operators and we're getting ready to lose more and so we had to um, make some adjustments because, you know, like I tell everyone, um, every position is essential. We need plant, water plant operators, right? right? I mean, every, because if they're not there, yeah. run the plants at night. So anyway, so we had to make some adjustments. Uh, Mark Hirsch, Workberg and HR and Chris Hassard are new. Water Resources Director got on that, and we've been able to counter some of the um, those that were getting ready to leave and kept them. But again, we had to take those were things we could wait for. We had to respond, and you know, I had meetings. I've had a couple meetings this week with other departments and other trades and other positions were falling behind again. So I think the five percent will at least across the board send a message to our employees, and we'll have to continue to make adjustments as we see where the market is. But we do both a comparison of public sector, and certainly when our positions are in competition on the private sector, we also have to look at that. Right. No, it's a challenge, especially when we're competing with the private sector. Um, they may offer more incentives and pay more money. So Absolutely. I think this is a good formula to try to keep our employees. We certainly don't want to leave, lose them. Uh, they have institutional knowledge as well as their expertise, and uh, we have to do everything we can to make sure that they stay here. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Yeah, I, I would like to you know, echo that too. We have amazing staff here. Um, I think everybody sitting out here has done a, a great job for, for at least the seven years that I've been on council uh, and very deserving. And thank you for uh, to all the employees for hanging with us um, through all this. Um, Chris, a while back we did a, we kind of talked um, through the public safety sales tax and how that was going with um, hiring new recruits. And so we're focused really on the recruitment of new officers, but what are we doing for retention of our current officers? Or, you know, can, can you um, at some point in time come back with a presentation maybe and talk about what we're doing for retention programs to sure. keep our officers so sure. that they're not, you know, 
for example, some of those that are going in to drop uh, instead of leaving early, what, is, what can we do to keep them here through their, their entire five years? Sure. Well, I, I can tell you this month alone, uh, and I've, <clears throat> I've met with officers um, Monday morning um, in a presentation, and I think um, we got their attention because they know that in January they'll receive the $2,000 that all employees will get they'll receive the, they're going to, well, they don't know until now, right now, this morning. I told them they're going to get something, but they had to wait till today. They're going to get the 5% Surprise. across the board. <laughs> yeah. But they're also getting, a, police officers are also getting $2,500. It's only for police officers. So they're, so let's say it's $4,500 plus 5%. <coughs> so that $4,500 dollars i am going to say is closer to 6%. So in one month, they're probably close to 10% pay increase. Maybe a little less, but it's about in that range. So I, that, those are certainly, we think, are hopefully can help out with that. So okay. good. Mayor, Councilmember Thompson, we have also been working with sergeants, case carrying detectives, lieutenants, all the way up, and commanders to see, make sure we are appropriately compensating them, make sure they're being taken taken care of like the swarm, some of the swarm members were that were represented, so that we are addressing this throughout the entire organization to keep the people um, that we currently have. So it's not just uh, trying to hire new people, it's trying to keep them. And we've been probably, I would say on a monthly basis, I'm going to Chris with something saying, hey, I need to do this to help the people who have already been here. And that's great. And, and again, uh, thank you guys, thank you Chris for, for bringing, the, bringing this up. and in addressing this, because this this is going to be an issue ongoing, I think, especially as the uh, as the market changes and more people are not willing to, to go into a brick and mortar office anymore. They want to work from home. So, um, thanks for addressing this. Thank you. Other other council questions or comments? Uh, all right. So this is. Uh, also, to provide direction, I don't know that we need a motion. Just want to make sure if I see yeah. the nods of the heads, thumbs up, whatever it might be. <laughs> Thank you. Let's hear from Mr. Freeman. You know, Mr. Pombier, thank for your comment. So you're talking about benchmarking for certain positions on, on the department. And are you doing the same for fire? I mean, public safety personnel. I mean, every employee is essential. I want, want to say that. So when you talk... At, All okay. positions get those kind of reviews. Okay. And we've had those discussions with both police and fire and looked at, as you know, we made significant adjustments in the fire department for personnel who were benchmarking against um, Chandler specifically. And so we made a lot of those adjustments in the last year and a half. Um, and uh, part of the conversation, too, with uh, our discussions with the labor groups was that was the preference for fire to take care of those individuals on the police side. They were content with making sure all their employees received a significant increase. So that $2,500 only applies to police patrol, op police op swarm officers, um, and fire chose to do a different methodology. So I don't want to be I want to be careful not to compare the two because sure. that was, no. was a preference of their leadership. Was there concern about the step pay in itself? There's always concern <coughs> about step pay, and okay. I think what, but it, but it, we have to remember that step pay is a component of the of the wage system. You know, everybody goes, well, we should get guaranteed a certain percentage of step pay. Okay. But when you compare how other cities are doing that, if they're doing a more, a higher level of step pay per year, their ranges are s smaller than ours, right? So the trade off is you top out sooner. If you want to have higher ranges, then the, the guarantee of the step pay is less. So it's trade off. We can have annual increases higher. Frankly, nobody can argue this year because they're getting much more than 5% in a year. But the step pay can be 5%, but you max out sooner. Or the step pay can be maybe a smaller increment and you make you end up having to be able to earn more because your high wage or high range is higher than the rest. So if we want to go to, you know, Step, the thing is, we have agreements, right, that are in place. We've allocated the dollars, so we're, we're pretty good for at least the next three years, right? We will keep watching it from a market standpoint, but at least the agreements we have in place with the labor unions are good for three years. So um, we think we're, we're in good position there. And Mayor and Councilmember Freeman, we 
We do the exact same thing on fire in terms of we always look at the when we open up a position like a battalion chief position, we look at how many people are applying to make sure we're and if we see a small number, we try to figure out why is that compensation? Is it work life balance? What is causing that? So we are constantly looking at that. I will be honest with you right now between COVID and the uh, the difficulty in getting people to work to, to come to work. We run into our biggest problem is not pay. I don't hear that. I met with the labor unions this week. The biggest problem wasn't pay. It was people are getting tired of working overtime. So what can we do to do that? It's so, not so a, John, this is, your, your problem is not working overtime. It's getting people to show up to work. Right. <clears throat> how do how do we get people to come to work and how do we whether it's illness or whether it's they're just fatigued? How do we get people to come to work is our bigger issue than actual pay right now. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Thompson. Well, in, in bringing that up, um, are there opportunities for employees to do work from home, um, the non-essentials? Sure, we have a, we have a um, remote work policy. Yeah, okay. we have that. It's in there. Okay. But like I tell everybody, the whole, you, all of us who get to work in cubicles and in Missile Plaza, that's really nice. But 85% of our employees work in the field right. and do not have the option to work remotely. And I, we have to be very careful because they do pay attention and making how the different classes of employees are, what the rules are. And so we want to be safe, we want to be healthy, and I think we've accomplished that very well. Um, but 85% of our employees don't have the option, never would have the option, right. to work from home. And certainly during the last couple of weeks, we've, you know, that's a lot, we've allowed people that have been close contact or maybe have mild symptoms to work from home, and we have those options, right? But it's not a wholesale approach um, that we, you know, just take entire sections and have them work remotely. Um, if it's justified and there's a business reason for it or a health reason, we certainly look at it. But it's not generally, it's not built in as that's an assumption that a, a job is going to be remote 100% of the time. Great. Well, I, I, it, clearly the consensus of the council is, is supportive of this, and uh, I think it reflects what, what I hear when I'm in the community, which is the workforce is the number one issue for every business in our city, and recruiting and retaining good employees is, is critical. So the um, uh, city of Mesa is a lot of things, but one of, those, one of the most important things we are is an employer, uh, and uh, inflation is hitting all of us, and, and so I think this just uh, is... Uh, Mr. Brady has a keen eye for the obvious. You know, we need to we need to keep people coming to work. We need to continue to be an attractive place to work. And uh, and so I think, Mr. Brady, we we uh, applaud you for recognizing that and, and making these uh, these good in, uh, in, uh, adjustments. You bet. Uh, thank you very much. Next item on our agenda, item one B, is a presentation uh, and to provide direction on the citywide fiber optics network. Morning, Mayor and Council. I'll try not to fumble around with the microphone this morning, Mr. Brady. It's okay. <laughs> um, we came to you uh, uh, several times in the past, as you recall, about um, efforts to bridge the digital divide, and, and we talked about different phases. Uh, we talked about expanding the uh, public Wi-Fi that we've got. We also talked about private cellular, and then the long haul plan was going to be um, getting fiber to every home and business in the city. And so that's what we want to talk to you about today. And uh, with that, I'll uh, kick it over to Ian. Kick it off, yeah. Thanks so much. It's uh, my pleasure to be here to talk about this. So as Travis mentioned, um, we, we have decided that the best way to, to get an internet everywhere is through fiber. Um, and so what is fiber? Why, why is it different than what we have today? Fiber is essentially, um, transmitting data uh, uh, as light. Uh, so theoretically, you can get speeds uh, up to the speed of light, which is as fast as we know. So um, basically what that does is it gives us a huge uh, amount of new benefits um, uh, for the foreseeable future. So like I, I like to say, fiber future-proofs Mesa. Um, as you all know, companies that come to us uh, look to, to be able to be connected and to get access to the fastest speed possible. So fiber is that tool that would allow us uh, citywide to increase those opportunities. Um, in addition, it enhances our own organization's opportunities 
to further um, uh, put into place smart city uh, initiatives. Um, and it provides additional opportunities for us uh, and our community to reduce the digital divide. So our, our goal is to, to literally get this fiber to every premise within the city of Mesa. Uh, that's a very big undertaking. It's about 265,000 premises across our city. Um, and so we did a bunch of research. We said, basically, why, why don't we have fiber today already in Mesa? Why isn't it here like it is in some of our other communities? Um, and so we looked at a bunch of different options to see um, kind of what was going on and how we could enable this technology going forward. We looked uh, and, and have been speaking with our, our traditional uh, uh, service providers like Cox Communications. Um, we've looked into a, a, an opportunity for the city, perhaps, to do this on our own to have a city-owned network. And then we looked at um, public-private partnerships, kind of the best of, of all worlds. And so after doing that, we, we definitely noticed that there's a, there's a ton of challenges here. This is not an easy undertaking. It's very expensive. Like I mentioned, we have a big city, um, it, so it takes a long, long time. Um, and uh, potentially, today, we had some incompatible licensing to do a project at this scale. Um, and so we, we kind of looked at how do, we, uh, how do we fix that problem and, and we're really what are the best solutions for us. Um, what we came up with is this idea that not only do we want fiber everywhere, but what we think is the best thing for our community is something called an open access fiber network. Um, basically what that is, is fiber everywhere that allows multiple tenants, multiple service providers to be on that network at the same time. So you don't just have necessarily one internet service provider, you could have unlimited, frankly, that serve smaller portions of the community um, and, and everything in between. Uh, the public-private partnership option really looks like the best for us. Um, as I mentioned, because this is such a big undertaking for the city to do it all by ourselves, it's just really impractical. Um, it would be one of the largest capital undertakings that we've ever, ever done if we were to do it on our own. Um, so uh, we want the public-private partnership. We also know that because one of the goals is to get this everywhere and to have everybody have access to it, we need to ensure that it's a citywide deployment. And sometimes that actually makes it more attractive uh, for other service providers because they, they know they can do this at scale. Um, and that kind of brings some of the costs down for them. We also looked into um, uh, some license accommodations for this new type of deployment. Um, because uh, the open access model doesn't mean that a, a, um, an owner actually has to provide the service, they're just putting the infrastructure in the ground, we can kind of maybe uh, make some tweaks to our licenses to accommodate that in a way that we haven't been able to uh, in the past. And then we've also looked at a couple other things, um, some appropriate incentives um, that we could think about maybe making it a little bit more attractive, and then alternative uh, construction techniques. Uh, potentially as well, that, that would make this more feasible on a, on a citywide scale. Um, so after going through that whole process, we realized that we need to make sure we get the word out everywhere that Mesa is interested in this and that Mesa is potentially looking at um, some new ways of making this possible. Uh, and, and, and so we decided, I, we, we are proposing that we do a nationwide um, request for information search. Um, and we're working with a, a, a national uh, consultant on this that has been helping us uh, put together the proposal. Uh, we would send that proposal out to each of our legacy providers today to ensure that they know that they, you know, we, we want them uh, to be a part of this as well. We'd love to work with them on this, but we also want to kind of look at what's out there and, and, and what are some of these innovative ideas that are happening across the country that could maybe come to Mesa. And, and for folks, again, who, who were maybe unaware that Mesa was very, very interested in this, we want them to know that, there's, that this is the right time and there's some great opportunity uh, for them to be a part of our community. So, so that was just really a quick update. Travis, I don't know if I missed anything that you might want to touch on, but um, yeah, I would leave it, you know, please, uh, any questions you might have, I'd love to know if this is the right direction. Thank you, Mr. Luna. Um, absolutely, I think this is the way we've got to go, especially as we move towards the future. Um, are you working at all with National League of Cities through, because I'm on the, I just got reappointed to the ITC committee uh, that can perhaps um, provide you some support 
or some research that's out there or look at similar com similar communities that have done something like this? Have, have you done that? Or how can I help you do with that? Or Yeah, Ma Mayor and Council Member Luna, I mean, that would be great. So uh, we haven't engaged with them directly on this as of yet, but um, what we intend to do, especially with the RFI, is mm -hmm. get it out to any group that is that has touched this in any way so that they can kind of provide their feedback. Right. So I, yeah, I would love to work with you yeah. uh, on, on getting that. I mean, because there's no sense in reinventing the wheel. Oh, there's yeah. a model out there that that's doing it. You know, Chattanooga, for example, has, has fiber throughout their community. Um, the, the, the other idea I liked is a micro trenching. I don't know if Beth, Beth is probably going, well, what exactly does that mean? Uh, what does that mean in terms of, because what, how deep do we have to trench in order to put the traditional uh, conduit and both, uh, and as well as the fiber? What's and what is micro? What do you mean by that? Yeah, I mean, I, I so the micro trenching is a trench that's about <clears throat> two inches wide and, and 12 inches okay. deep. And and so you put micro interducts in, in there and, uh -huh. and then they cover it up. And, and so it's just a faster way to get in. It's, it's not as intrusive. Um, and I, the regular trenching, I think, is, uh, what, what that, is it's that? like 30, 36 inches or, or something like that. But it does raise concerns from a, you know, because you're, the depth isn't as deep. There's, you know, if you have to go back and do street reconstructions or street re uh, pavements, there's this, the concern about, you know, you're getting very close to that mm -hmm. over time. So it's been done in other cities. Um, there's been mixed results. But when you look <coughs> at the cost differential and the time to deliver, it's significant, right? Mm -hmm. It's materially different. And so the thought is this probably is, if you're gonna to try to deliver this across the entire city and keep it within, and again, these projects, one of the reasons that was, we've been looking at this is looking at, you know, even if the city were to do this, mm -hmm. you know, and we get into numbers that start with Bs, you know, and so it becomes really, very <laughs> expensive. Yeah. And so trying to find ways to reduce that cost and get the, um, and the micro, Trenching seems to be one of those um, methodologies that would allow us to significantly reduce the capital costs as well as, again, delivering the speed of which we could get it done. So it's, there's a trade-off there. Now, there may be costs down the road later if you know, we're doing some kind of street maintenance or street something in the street. We may have be dealing with that fiber also because it's going to be much closer to the surface. Mm -hmm. And, and Mayor and Councilmember, if, if, if I may, I, I want to make really clear that what we're suggesting today is not that we are necessarily going to offer right. any of this, but, but we are putting it on the table. And so right. we would love to see what those proposals look like that come back. And we would evaluate that. Uh, you know, uh, Beth's team is working with us on a daily basis on this. And so, they, they, you know, we, we need to look at everything before any decision is made. Yeah, Mayor and Councilmember Luna, I'd also like to add with regards to <clears throat> micro trenching, although it's a, a new approach. In the states, uh, in Europe, they've been doing it for I uh, think 20 to 30 years, and, and so it's not necessarily a new technology. Now, your di dark fiber licensing, exactly what do you what do you mean by that? Uh, well, Mayor and Councilmember Luna, so um, right now, uh, kind of our standard licensing is around a telecommunications license, right. which is actually for providers that are are doing the they're the actual ISP, so they're providing the actual service. That requires some additional licensing through the state before they can come in and work with us. Mm -hmm. A dark fiber provider is somebody who is just literally laying the groundwork. So it's like the you know they're laying the, they're putting the pipe down right. and. Um, so they're not necessarily doing the service. So if they aren't, we can say, hey, it doesn't really make sense to have to go through this extra step, this extra level of regulation before you come in and work with us. Now, their tenants, the actual service providers, would still be required to get that license. And are we doing that currently? Are we putting, when, when we're trenching, are we putting in dark fiber anyway? I think we're doing that, right? Oh, we, the we city? Are, yeah. yeah. Yes. We're putting in the- we're The conduits there, right? But are we, yeah, we're putting, do we do have some fiber <coughs> We, programs connecting some of our public safety, but we do put a lot of conduit in, right? Yeah. I mean, is that correct, Beth? Is that? Yeah. It, it's both, yes. Sorry. Yes. Good morning, Mayor. Beth, Beth, and I think you and I have had this Mayor. conversation before. Uh, as we're trenching, we're laying in the conduit. We, are we 
Are we yes. putting dark, dark fiber so in there? All of our um, capital projects that are horizontal capital streets projects, we're adding conduit into those projects mm -hmm. to accommodate it. Right now we're putting conduit in. If we lay fiber in it before we have users and people along the alignment, the fiber can age and start to have issues over time. Okay. So we really install the fiber when we have a need. The other thing is we have other programs besides micro trenching in terms of where we have existing conduits, we encourage um, dark fiber users and our ISP providers to actually lease the conduits for mm -hmm. us and use our conduits. Mm -hmm. It saves a lot of time for them and it um, takes a lot of the disruption out of our right of ways. Right, right. So we they lease it from us, we, they don't have to lay it. Uh, and then we get a return on that, is that correct? Yes. Okay. So, like, for instance, we have one, um, I guess you'd call them dark fiber uh, Zeo, mm -hmm. already in our in our in a lot of our conduits throughout Southeast Mesa, and they also help this as an in-kind mm -hmm. to complete the loops in Southeast right. Mesa. And that's at the Fiesta District, right? Is that um, no, it's really more in the Southeast. So we did we did do some on Southern in front right. of the yes, um, Santander area. Yeah. Santander, yeah. yes. Right, when we were doing the... the construction in that area. Okay. Great. And so we, we do offer those conduits where we have them and make them available to okay. providers. Great. All right. Well, this is exciting. I think we should move on. Go ahead on this. Absolutely. Mr. Thompson, then Mr. Heredia. Is my question, or uh, two questions. One is, is this creating another utility for the city? And if so, how do we stand up the, the, the employees to take care of the fiber if it's dug into and broken? And two is, what is our return on investment? And what does that pay off in how many years? So, uh, Mayor, Council Member Thompson, to respond to, um, to that, uh, this is a public-private partnership. So um, uh, what the expectation is, is that the private sector um, partner would come in and put the fiber in, so they would own the fiber and would a lot, a certain number of strands to the city for city use is what we hope, and 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 in exchange we would uh, make some some concessions, whatever that looks like, and it'd be negotiated. And so they would um, manage the fiber because they own it, and and they would take care of the breaks and the fixes and that sort of thing. So the return. So we're not. Well, we don't know what the answer is right now. Whether we're going to be asked us to provide some kind of funding to it. The thought is we're providing access to the right-of-way and, if you would, developing a plan with a provider, or maybe they'll have some partners, to provide conduit fiber throughout the entire whole city. So the return on investment, it's not that we're getting any money back and hopefully we're spending, we're not having to put out a lot of money. Maybe we waive fees or something like that. But the return is that every household, the 260, whatever mm -hmm. numbers, numbers to say for, mm -hmm. uh, they have, they will, all, every home will have the ability to connect to fiber, literally running in front of their house, right? And then they can choose, obviously, whether they tap into that or not. And we just think that's, you know, where the world's going, having that option for every home in Mesa is, would be huge. Um, but we're not intending that we're we're not owning that, you know, then other, the private sector comes and gets there. We did go down that path. That's why it's been a while since we've come back to council. We did look at kind of where you're going with this is what if this were a city utility, right, where we installed it, owned it, and managed it. And that's when it, it's just one, the upfront capital costs would have been tremendous and it would have required us to do, may have been a significant debt commitment. But if you're doing something for the whole city, I mean, that might be understandable. But even just coming up with the modeling about w how we would cost recover that, and, and then it, once we build it, would we get, you know, the companies to come in and lease that from us? And that would just felt like it was a lot of risk on our part. So we're willing to let the private sector uh, who does this take that risk on, and we will work with them in managing it in the right of way. At least that's the plan right uh -huh. now we're saying so. Frankie. The uh, question on the, is there a current map <coughs> of where we have current fiber mm -hmm. uh, that yep. we can have shared? Um, and then also as far as capacity on households and businesses, uh, <laughs> if we put fiber all across the city, 
Do we know that households and businesses have the capacity? We have a mixed uh, housing, uh, uh, right? So old and new. Is there capacity or would they have to, uh, I guess, work with a provider to set up that capacity, right, to take in fiber? Is yeah. that? Yeah, Mayor, Mayor and Councilmember Heredia, yeah, absolutely. So, so what would happen here is if an individual household or business wanted to connect, they would work with whoever the ISP happens to be to kind of do that last mile connection from, from the line that's right in front of their house to their wall. Um, but I mean, the technology is, you know, once it gets into your house, it's just as all of us probably have with a route, you know, it hooks up to a router and, or what have you. And um, so the, the intrusive part is, yeah, digging through, but that would be up to them and their ISP if they wanted to connect. Okay. But everybody, I, I should clarify, every premise would have the opportunity to do that, you know, new or old build, it can happen. Okay. And then curious on the open access model as more uh, vendors go in, does that slow up speed or is that, it, it, is, it, how does that work as far as, is there more entry into those points uh, connected? Does that slow up the, that area where those uh, more vendors are in uh, on that conduit? Mayor, Councilman, Member Heredia, um, that would not be the case. Um, so each fiber strand would be dedicated to a, a internet service provider and, and so the premise that's connected to this strand of fiber would be a dedicated shot back to their communications uh -huh. hut and, and it would go into a switch and, and be distributed and so so um, it would not be um, limited sort of like um, I described with, with the Wi-Fi and the, the you know and the public um, cellular the the more folks that actually go into it can slow the response yeah. down, but you've got a, a design for that uh, fiber. That's not the, not the case, that's the, the beauty of, of that. And then last question, uh, as far as timeline, how, how long do we anticipate? I know we're asking for uh, proposals, but how long does this uh, type of project Last. Well, so, so Mayor and Councilmember Heredia, so we, we do plan to go out, um, assuming this is the direction you want to go next week, we would, we would put this proposal out there. You know, we'll give about 45 days or so for responses, and then we would evaluate it at that point. Um, you know, I, I can't really give you a solid estimate as to how long it would take after that, because it really depends on the proposals that we receive back. And, and the evaluation that would, the next step that would be to go into that. I mean, but we, we want to get this done. I mean, we've been working on this for, for a very long time, and, and so the sooner the better. Yeah, Mayor, Councilor Reddy, I think it's gonna be one of a couple of different things is see what kind of responses we get. <clears throat> Make sure we have someone who has some expertise and experience in this. But really behind all that is they have to be, demonstrate they have the capital funding behind them. So to your point is once they start, we know they can cover the whole city. Mm -hmm. And because we know based on just us having gone through kind of this calculation ourselves, estimation about what would it take for us to run that through the whole city, we know that's a big capital yeah. lift. So it's got to be somebody who not only has this expertise in this area, but standing behind them, they're going to have to have pretty substantial funding. And so we will have to evaluate all that because that will help us know that their commitment to go get it done uh, citywide, and of course, once they start, they're going to go as quickly as possible because then they sure. can start recovering back. So those are things we'll bring back to you and, and look at. So, uh, Mayor and Council, I'd also like to um, add that the the reason we want to do this open access model is you've got single ISPs that can come in and say they want to do this, but there's no competition, right? And so, so they can actually go to every premise. A single ISP can go to every premise in the city and folks still not be able to support it, right? And, and if you've got open access now, the smaller ISPs and, and other ISPs can come in and, and get on that, that fiber and so that creates competition and, and so that's gonna help our um, underserved parts of the community that can't afford it. Thank you. <clears throat> other questions? Okay. Uh, <clears throat> Other they, questions? They answered all mine. Okay. Very good. Great. Well, uh, this is, uh, there's a lot of work that's gone into getting this to this point. So I just want to thank Travis and Ian and, and everyone else, Mr. Brady, uh, Mr. Butler, others that have worked hard on this. <clears throat> I think 
uh, this Mesa really is on the cutting edge of this. So we talk about, well, what other models can we look to and you know, steal these ideas from other communities? Well, I think we're, we're the ones that are going to be speaking at the uh, National League of Cities uh, conferences about how we did this because it, it, uh, uh, there are other models out there like Chattanooga, but it's, it's this model where the, the city invests a billion dollars which uh, is, is, I think, scary for all of us for very good reason and, and probably not the right direction. So uh, I, I absolutely endorse this. I, I love Ian's uh, quote, uh, fiber future proofs our community. That, that, that is the gold standard. That's where we all want to get. If we have fiber to all of the homes and businesses in our city, we will be amazing. Uh, and there will be a, a long line of people standing in front of City Hall asking us how we did that. So. Uh, this is a, a great, I appreciate all the hard work that's gone into it, and, and certainly I add my uh, support to going forward with the, uh, the proposal. Thank you. Great. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. The next item on our agenda is item 1C. It's, to, um, it's a presentation and to provide direction on three proposed pr uh, projects to address homelessness using American Rescue Plan Act funding. The projects are off the streets, Workforce Job Access Center, and bridge programs. Natalie, thanks for being here to update us on this. Good morning, Mayor, and thank you for having me. Um, my name's Natalie Lewis, and I work in the city manager's office. And um, behind me, there's a lot of people, community members and staff, but among them are some of my core team members for this, this work, Detective Aaron Rain, and also a new member of our team, Lynn Spillers, who's a human service coordinator. Um, so we're all here to support you and, um, and support the city in this work. There will be three different projects, as you mentioned, Mayor, that we're going to talk about today. Um, each of them is sort of at a different level of detail, um, but all of them are projects that we are recommending be supported by rescue funds. So we wanted to come to you today and present them and make sure that you are on the same page we are um, to continue moving forward with the projects. So first, before we go into that, I always like to remind the council and the community about our overall strategy for addressing homelessness. And, and core to that is this housing path to recovery. And as you'll see on the slide, there are, there are five general steps here. And, and our goal as a city, um, when we have city funds, when we have federal dollars, when we're partnering with other communities, is we're constantly looking at this infrastructure and making sure that our investments in time and resources are put here. Um, there are still gaps in the infrastructure. There are still ways for us to do better, um, but, um, but this is our path and how we're trying to kind of create a strategy for success for people who want help. So the very first one is what we refer to as emergency housing. Um, and this is where we can get people immediately off the streets if they want help. We can get them into shelter. We can help stabilize them, get them services. And, and this is where we do a lot of work with them to get them to commit to a path of recovery. It's hard work. And everybody has their own story and different needs. And so, um, you know, it, it's a different level of time and readiness. But this is where we do that work. And once we get them to commit to recovery, we do what we call graduate them into um, additional programming and more stable housing on this path. So the second step is what we would refer to as shelters and congregate type housing. Um, this is where there's more rules. Um, they are, um, you know, getting out there and looking at jobs and getting some training for jobs, and they're starting to get some. Um, some skills, some life skills um, training and getting ready to uh, be independent eventually. The third um, step is bridge and transitional housing. So what happens to a lot of people is they've, they've gotten right off the streets, they made the commitment, they've gone to their congregate shelter and they're making really good progress and they're demonstrating that progress, but they're not quite ready just to launch into um, their own apartment um, maybe they haven't gotten a voucher, maybe they need some rent assistance, maybe they need to shop for it. So this is the place where we would have our, our people who've demonstrated success um, and they are showing their recovery success. They'll still be getting um, some services, but it'll be reduced over time. And, and so we just don't wanna lose them because there's been a lot of work that they've done and that we've put in to their recovery. And so we wanna make sure we have that space 
for people. It's also for families um, who are potentially just evicted, you know, during the pandemic, and they're very eager to be rehoused. And so this is a place for them to go and again, try to shop for some additional housing and get connected to the resources that we have at the city and in the community. The fourth step is what we refer to as affordable rental. Um, and this is semi-independent. And again, we're trying to get to a point where we're reducing services. Um, and this is, again, vouchers, rent assistance, what they call it um, tenant-based rental assistance, all different kinds of things to get people um, on their way. And then finally is just affordable housing. And now they're um, in the, their own home and they're working towards home ownership and eventually independence. So the three projects I'm gonna be talking about today are basically in these three areas, emergency, the jobs training, and the transitional um, housing. And the process that we used to get here is um, we did do a request for proposals to all of our partner agencies in Mesa um, back in the summer of 2021. We received 28 proposals. Two of them are city-related proposals. Of the 28, it was about $92 million in requests. And um, for ARPA or for rescue dollars, we have about $25 million set aside, a good chunk of the city's allocation to find local and regional solutions for homelessness. So it was a process to really figure out, you know, which ones to bring forward. So we considered previous council feedback. We were looking for long-term sustainable solutions. We have existing partnerships out there that we've already invested in and that can grow and do better. And of course, we wanna close gaps in our housing path to recovery. So emergency housing. This is the Off the Streets program. It was launched in May of 2020. And what we wanna do with the rescue dollars is continue the program through the end of calendar year 2024. It's been a project that has demonstrated really good success. 71% um, of those that, have, that we have served in the program since May 2020 have actually graduated into their path of recovery. We have 75 rooms that we lease at a, a local hotel. We have on-site police security that help keep that campus safe um, and um, um, any help that we might need if there are crises that occur. And we provide human services there. We have, we have a partnership with a local nonprofit, Community Bridges, and they provide those wraparound services. Um, for the budget that we're talking about with the rescue dollars, we are adding 5,000 um, nights for housing more pets. We have found that a lot of our homeless have pets and they are their companions, they are their family. And even though they really wanna get help, if we can't accommodate their pets, they'll turn us down. And so we're finding lots of different ways to accommodate pets and this will be another part of our toolbox there. We're adding a passenger van, a nine passenger, 10 passenger van, with the idea being that um, CBI can then use it to take our um, participants to offsite services. Um, we're less enthusiastic about bringing all the services to this campus um, because the services are out there and we don't wanna duplicate and so we wanna just connect them as, as we can. We're also adding a 24 seven hotline, I would call it, for our park rangers and our police department. So they have one telephone number to call. They find someone in the field that wants help. We're gonna make sure we have beds set aside for this and they can, the CBI can connect them. So the program will cost about $2.3 million per year. And again, it continues the funding through the end of calendar year 2024. And it allows the city to explore longer term solutions for the program. As we're seeing such good success, it's likely we'll wanna continue it. So in the shelter and jobs area, we're suggesting a new workforce development and jobs access center. And we would have it located at the former Mesa Counts on College um, and Mesa Can building, which is owned by a new leaf. It's near Broadway and Stapley. And um, so with that, there's a partnership here and it's between the city, but also with New Leaf and Mesa Can and Maricopa County. Uh, they have a very robust program called Arizona at Work. We're gonna bring that here. New Leaf has programs that are jobs training related. Those will come here as well. 
and we will be focusing more on adults that are um, 26 years and older, which allows the library that also has an Arizona at Work capacity to focus on youth um, younger than that. We're recommending $250,000 of rescue dollars, and it will help us with some startup funds, but it will also help us um, or cover the share of staffing costs for the city through 2024. We're hoping we'll be able to serve um, at least 200 people, more if we can. We're excited about the location being in the, a neighborhood that is low to moderate income already and um, can very easily um, access it. We know there are Mesa CAN clientele who um, will have synergy and we can, we can get them to these services already. We're gonna work on the data analysis so that we can demonstrate that it's worth continuing the program. And we also want this system to become, or this place to become a hub. Um, so if there's anyone in the community that doesn't know where to go to get these kinds of services, we want them to come to us and we will connect them. So this is a um, example of the types of services out there. There are existing programs for the city or other services that we would wanna connect people to. Um, the young adults, as I said, at our Mesa libraries, our, our foster care youth, um, low to moderate income families, you know, in particular those families that have been impacted by the pandemic. Maybe they you know, are working in um, low end jobs and they wanna skill up. And we wanna help them do that and stay in Mesa and be successful. There are lots of different programs out there right now, and so the hub piece of that will help. St. Joe's the Worker is one of them, and um, they focus on the recovering homeless, and they do an amazing job of holding them accountable and helping them kind of continue their, their path forward. So we wanna connect into that. Um, we wanna work with our school districts. They're a great partner. They, we, we call them the invisible homeless sometimes, and these are families with young children. Sometimes they live in their cars. Sometimes they're doubling up with other families. It's not healthy, and they're very eager to, to find housing and help. And so we want to be able to skill them up and get them access to some either college or licensing and, and, and really kind of help with the overarching goal of um, our education goals in, in Mesa and increasing that for adults in Mesa. Um, we know that we have people that are already getting our rent assistance, our vouchers. We have a family self-sufficiency program. All of these should connect. Our Mesa po um, College Promise graduates, if they need help getting out there and finding a job, we wanna connect with them. And we are always now gonna be working regionally and, and doing everything we can to connect into regional resources um, for, for Mesa residents too. Bridge and transitional housing. Um, this is proposed at the East Valley Men's Center. And, and again, this is specifically for our success cases. So the idea would be that the men at the East Valley Men's Center, which I understand is a little over 100 men, um, once they gain success, they've gone through the program, they're showing and demonstrating that they're able to stay stable and they're able to hold down a job, but they might need a little bit more time to get on their feet and to again, find housing. Um, the idea is they would then build transitional housing on the campus um, to allow for that housing path to recovery. So it would look like 30 independent studio apartments at the existing campus. Um, New Leaf is suggesting that we add 2,000 square foot facility with it to allow for some additional programming and services. Um, and in particular, they're looking at some um, human services, but health services as well to help um, minimize the impact on our fire department and the response that they have there. We, we see these um, individuals um, being positive role models for the other men so that hopefully they can see there's another step for them. Uh, we're estimating in rescue dollars about six to eight million dollars. Um, the operating costs would be um, funded in full by New Leaf and you know, through other partnerships they have with other, um, the county and, and other cities. And they have some, had some preliminary discussions with the community that has at least said, yeah, we'd like to hear more about this. Um, so we're suggesting to move forward with that one and, and see what we, can, what we can do. So if council concurs today um, for off the streets, I would move forward right away to execute an updated agreement with the hotel and the service provider and continue the program through 2024. 
for the Jobs Access Center, I would be bringing back an intergovernmental agreement that's already been approved by the county, um, but for our city council to approve it, and that's with the staffing, we're sharing costs on the staffing. And I would bring back a lease agreement, which is for a dollar a year from New Leaf, so that we can actually solidify and save the space for this. Um, our goal would be to do the startup activities and really work on our marketing and open this up in the spring of this year. For the transitional housing at the East Valley Men's Center, this has the least amount of detail at this point. We really feel we need a feasibility study to make sure that it is um, something that can be built um, at the site. We would like to have some, uh, some additional community outreach and an, an updated cost estimate as, as we move forward. So with that, I just wanna make sure council, um, if you have any questions for me on those three programs, or if you can give me your head nod, that's, that's what I need today. Great, I think you're gonna get a lot of all of the above. Uh, let's start with Mr. Luna. Uh, thank you, Natalie, and I appreciate that Mike Hughes is here because I'm gonna ask him about the Men's Center. Um, well, maybe Mike can come up. It's, it's uh, you know, I used to be on a prehab board a long time ago, mm -hmm. so I'm familiar with the men's center. And I remember this is one room where we had, where we're housing all the men. So, and then they expanded it and created a kitchen. Is that right, Mike? And then, yes. So the whole idea is to, to build, construct a building uh, for greater capacity. And uh, I'm assuming your board is in support of this as you move forward? Yes. Okay, okay. Um, the other thing I was gonna ask you is now, uh, you talked about the Mesa Council College. It's going to be a workforce development center. Where did all those computers go? Are they going? Are they still there? Or because that was where students <coughs> that were going to um, college would, you know, apply for go through their GED programming and that. How has that changed, mm -hmm. and how are you making that transition? So, um, thank you, Councilmember Luna and Mayor. The Mesa Council on College office has now become our education and workforce. Um, development office and they have moved to the Mesa City Plaza to be closer and, and be able to connect more with the city and other resources that we have and the programs. The, the equipment that was there has been repurposed in lots of different ways. Last year during COVID and the year before when lots of the school districts were closed and there wasn't access to um, students having FAFSA, um, you know, completion. We created a new model, and, and it was basically a drive-through type of a FAFSA event, and it was highly successful. Mm -hmm. And so we continued that. We did that in 2020. We continued it in 2021. We did it just this this month, as you all know. And um, and it was less. Um, there was less people there. It was a great event. There were fewer people there. So we're going to start talking again with the school district mm -hmm. about um, about that program and just making sure that you know what we do complements and supplements what they're doing as well. Mm -hmm. But those computers have been repurposed. Okay. And Mike, maybe you can speak to Mesa Can, uh, its facility, and now you've got upstairs the workforce development. How does that complement each other? How does that work? Oh, I think it complements. Uh, extremely well because many of the people who come in for utility assistance, rental assistance, they're needing additional services. Mm -hmm. And so th this, this, this really pairs up nicely with mm -hmm. us being able to do that. Now as far as staffing, will that be Mesa Can staffing or how is that going to work? It would be Mesa Can staffing. Okay. In addition to um, a staff member, a full-time staff member that is split cost between the county and the city. Great. Those are my questions. Thank, Thank you. you. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thompson. I have a whole slew. <laughs> um, okay. Regionally, what are other cities doing to, um, to help with this issue, with the homeless issue? Again, I'll always bring it up from a regional standpoint. Um, and one reason, we, I was on a ride along with PD um, a couple of weeks ago, and we spent most of the night um, pushing homeless out of bus bays. It was cold and rainy, uh, but we had actually had citizens that were standing in the rain because we had homeless people sleeping on the benches. And so we were kicking boots and moving people um, to, to get off the, the benches so that people could sit down, our citizens could sit down. Um, and we encountered this one young man that said he was, uh, came over from, a, or he landed in Apache Junction and they told him they didn't have services there, he needs to go to Mesa. 
So from a regional standpoint, I keep going back to this regional, 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 because why is a person that lands in Apache Junction pushed to Mesa and uh, landing in District 5? Um, when, uh, from a regional standpoint, if Apache Junction is, is uh, playing um, nice with us, they should have the services and be able to offer help to that person and not force him to walk another you know, 10 miles down the road to, to Mesa. Um, second is um, navigators. Uh, you know, the officers were telling me that there are no navigators at night. So when they encounter a homeless person that wants help, there's nothing they can really do because nobody's available, no navigators are available to come out um, in the evenings uh, or when uh, pause is, is closed. Um, so we re really need, um, to focus in that arena mm -hmm. of having navigators, because our officers can't just continue to bounce from, you know, from homeless shelter, for, from homeless camp to homeless camp, trying to, to move people around. Um, what do we do? Also, the third thing is, what do we do with the homeless that we encounter that have um, drugs, or are on drugs, or are drunk? or have something like MRSA, because we can't transport them. Nobody's gonna take them. We can't put them in, we can't even take them to our own jail, much less to county. Um, so what do we do with, because that was a lot of the people we encountered that night um, were on drugs. Um, and there are some out there that have MRSA and stuff like that. And you're, what do you do with them? Right, so you might have to remind me about the three questions, but I'll try to, to answer them <laughs> in order. So. Thank you um, for bringing up regionalism. Um, Apache Junction is, is part of the, the MAG region and they are actually a great partner and are working to build services in their city and want to help be part of the region and regional solutions. So I can't speak to the one person that you spoke to, but I can tell you that they are part of that conversation um, as we move forward. You asked how other communities are dealing with workforce development. Um, and this population, and generally there's, there's two ways that have been, have been going, or two models, if you will. Um, Arizona at Work is a pretty robust um, system throughout the state of Arizona. And so um, many times they just use those services to refer people to those centers. Um, the other model is more of what we're talking about here. The city of Tempe has been doing this for a long time and seen great progress with it. And that is to partner with the county and bring that into the city. So again, the, we, are, we are providing the services because we're connecting people um, from the programs that we're already doing into the service very directly and or referring them to other places and doing that in a way that it's a warm handoff so that um, you know, the people feel like they're not being lost and just, and just punted, if you will. Um, on our police officers, um, absolutely, we feel like it's our duty. They're out there doing this every day and we've asked them to be proactive and to help <clears throat> us with this because they are our eyes and ears out there 24 <laughs> seven. And so um, we really feel like we owe them good process and support. And so we've been working on that. Um, and I will talk about um, more of the navigators and I'll continue that dialogue and conversation. But you know, that's one of the reasons why we wanted to have the van at the center because we want to have um, community bridges available to go dispatch it in the middle of the night and go help pick somebody up. Because you know, a lot of times it's, it's more complicated than you think. It's not just taking someone to the hotel. They have a lot of stuff with them and what do you do with that? And so, um, so we're working on those kinds of things um, to make it easier. And that the, the hotline is, is another example of that. May, may I add something to that? Uh, Council Member Thompson, I, 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 and I, as you know, I've been around a long time. And uh, I, I honestly believe that uh, I think that the cities are working more collaborative, collaboratively now than ever before. I think it really has become a partnership. And I've seen Mesa not just be the hub of trying to solve everybody's problems, Mesa and Phoenix. Uh, Glendale is getting very, very involved. Surprise is building a, a family center that we're involved in. Uh, Apache Junction is trying to support the city of Tempe. The county is actually in the 
in one of the strongest partnership roles that I've ever seen. And so there really is, I, I know that you have expressed concern that everything's gravitating to Mesa, but I, I, I think you would be pleased to know that that actually is, is being uh, worked with and it's not just being dumped on uh, Mesa and Phoenix, but the other cities realize that there has to be a stronger partnership has to be a stronger collaboration, and that really is taking place now more than ever. And then the follow-up was, what do we do with those that we encounter that are on drugs or that have uh, some type of disease that we can't transport or help? Because nobody will take them. Right, so thank you again. Um, Community Bridges has their own facilities that we can take them immediately to those um, to, for for substance abuse in particular and some behavioral health types of things, but they also have connections to other agencies that provide those services. And so, you know, it's their job to connect people who, again, want help. Uh, we can't um, help everyone, and especially if they're not gonna work with us. And the homeless population, you know, it's, it's a lot of times a sense of readiness and getting to a point where they're, they're just fatigued and tired of the lifestyle and they're, they're decided that they want to work on their substance abuse, you know, problem if that's what it is, and and so they're willing to do the the hard work. And so, the work that we're trying to do is getting to those people and bringing them in and wrapping them with services and helping them to be successful, and then contacting the people that you're talking about time and time again to help them get ready. But Councilman Thompson, to your point, I, I think we need to be careful not to overstate this. There will be times when a patrol officer will be out there and engage with a someone who's uh, homeless, whether at a bus shelter or wherever they might be. There will be times when there just won't be availability of community bridges or a facility. I mean, those times are going to happen, right? And we know, it, and I know it does happen because I've been on those ride-alongs too. And so, um, we are trying to do everything we can to provide that patrol officer the tools, the resources they need. And so we hope that maybe not every time they can have access because there are some officers out there who really, um, you know, they have hearts of gold. They're trying not to just to be there mm -hmm. to trespass and to get somebody to move on, but they're really trying to help somebody, right? It's, it's, and it's a different type of approach by that officer. It's not just, hey, get out of my beat. I don't want you on my beat. It's more like, hey, how can I help you as a fellow human being? And we've got it, we're working really hard to try to figure out how we can help that officer be that connection to, you know, like community bridges or any, and we're talking to some other regional groups that have expertise in mental health behavior. So we're trying to establish that network to support that officer. But yes, there will be times when that officer, and there'll be conditions where there may not be anything they can do, unfortunately. But, we, are, we think we're getting better at it and we're gonna improve. And as I keep committing to the officers, our, my commitment is to make their job easier. And, and so when they are in those situations, they have better resources. But we're better off than we were, but we're not, we can't deal with every situation. There's no doubt sometimes that will happen. Well, I, just, I really want, just want to make sure that there's um, access for the officers at night. We you get know, that. Because during we, the day, there's, there's right. lots of availability of of of, uh, just, of help, but right. at night there's not. That's a fair. It's a fair point, and we just have to work with our partners to see what, how we can make those available. But we'll we'll continue to work on that. Thank you. I want to express my support for these three um, these three programs. I know that you've worked really hard with your team to figure out what the best solutions are. So a couple of um, thoughts on this. Um, First of all, with the off the streets, that is in my district, and so I have heard um, nothing but good that's have been happening there. Um, the neighborhood's appreciative of the 24-7 um, police presence there. It's helped with crime in the area. It's been great. I, I'm in full support of continuing. Um, with the hotline, who takes those calls? Where does the hotline go? I don't want to um, add another number to our already overworked dispatch. Like, So what, what does that look like? <laughs> exactly. Mayor, Council of Member Spilsbury, Community bridges. Okay. They will manage that. Okay, 24-7 then. 
Okay, and that number, so will be put out there to the community so that anyone that's concerned about homeless will call that number or? So thank you for clarifying that. Okay. We're gonna start first okay. with our police officers and our park rangers. Okay. And we're gonna test the system and how we can use it. We might expand then to city employees because okay. we also want our city employees who are out there to have access and a telephone number. Um, and then as it relates to the community, we'll take that kind of that bite at the apple when we get there. Okay, because I know that's always a question that we get is from community Absolutely. members of who can we call, what can we do? I saw several at the Mesa Art Center this morning as I drove by. So, I mean, it's just, it's just something that's always out there in front of people. So, okay. Thank great. you. And then um, the Workforce Jobs Access Center, I think is a great idea. I, in my tour this last year of all the different nonprofits, I don't think I went to one that didn't have a workforce development room or office or, mm -hmm. you know, something. So I would really like to see um, a good list maybe of like, this is what House of Refuge does. This is what Save the Family does and just see what's out there and, and how they're using those services. And so where are those gaps and, and mm -hmm. so that we're not duplicating any of that work that's already being done. But I think this is great to create that hub mm -hmm. and collaboration there. Um, and then I've also been out to the East Valley Men's Center and it's incredible what's going on out there and it, it seems like a good place for this kind of transitional housing when our, we know our city is in, has shortage of that particular kind of housing. So I think that makes a lot of sense. I would like to look into some of these models that are happening with turning old hotels into um, some of this transitional housing cast that has that one in Phoenix that mm -hmm. they're turning into a veterans. Um, a place for veterans to live for transitional housing. And so I think we could do more in that area as well. So instead of building a new building, um, which maybe is perfect for this location and needed, so not saying to do it instead of that, but we also, all through my district down Maine, we have all kinds of opportunities that we could use <laughs> as well. So, okay, th those are my thoughts. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Mayor. Thank, thank you, Natalie, for our prior conversations regarding this. And Mr. Hughes, thanks for being here. You're um, You know, I'm looking forward to our point in time survey, survey coming up because this will kind of give us a, a, a pulse of what's going on in our community and, and be able to ask questions and be able to provide direction to our nonprofits and everybody that we, we work with. I cherry picked a couple of questions. Uh, Natalie, could you explain on our Mesa libraries uh, how you can strengthen them and transitionally wise, you know, we have people come over to our libraries to access our computers. And is there some going to be some correlation between that and Mesa CAN? Um, so, yeah, Mayor, Council Member Freeman, uh, what we've done at the main library in particular, which is the area, you know, around that campus, we've seen a lot of homeless activity. And so one of the things that we did is, because we're trying to balance the needs in the community, and, and what we want is our families um, who have children, young children, to feel safe and, and to be at the libraries and to be able to use them. But, you know, it's also not illegal to be homeless, and, and if somebody is there and they're homeless and they're not, they're following the rules, they're <coughs> allowed to be there. But sometimes there's a little bit of conflict and misperceptions about the, that mix, and so, the project that we did just recently was to um, expand the children's area, the children's and family area on the first floor. We relocated all of the adult activities to the second floor. Um, we have ended up reducing the number of computers that we have slightly because there's so many online activities and virtual activities that are going on at our libraries. Um, and those computers now have time limits associated with them so that everybody can have access to them and there's not people, you know, standing or being on it for, you know, all day long. Um, so that's what we're trying to do to strengthen the library. And, um, and then again, the Arizona at work, but the youth piece and focus would still be at the main library too. We have navigators there as we well. Have, we're, we're actually rehiring a navigator. We let it go when the, the facility was closed, but we're actually bringing that person back on. And we also are hopeful that person can help bring people from the library over to the new access center. Okay. And as you work with our nonprofits, and uh, the question was, I thought of, is there a certain percentage of beds or shelters that would be available for MESA contacts versus other parts of our community? or municipalities that surround us. Um, so thank you, Mayor. Council Member Freeman, um, that's, a, that's a difficult conversation. And, and it is one that we've started. We've started it with, with New Leaf and with Mr. Hughes on, um, you know, 
acknowledging, and he has acknowledged, that Mesa invests a lot of money into the East Valley Men's Center, for example. And so making sure that we have access to beds when we need them is something that we continue to work on. Um, it's a balancing act. We don't want to have a whole bunch of beds sitting there empty and there's lots of need and, you know, so, so we need to keep working on that, but we are. Okay. And then uh, for Mr. Hughes, I know the East Valley Men's Shelter is in the county. And are you working with the county to maybe find some other leveraging any funding there for yes. your, your... Yes, yes. Because you're going to have that development that you need some capital costs for right. that, which I support that, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, I know it's in my district, but I can see the transition there from the current housing you're doing now, then this wraparound social right. services for those individuals that need to move up in the tier. Thank you. You bet. That's all I have, Mayor. Thanks. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yes, thank you for all your work on this. It's tremendous and it's so urgent. Um, we can't do enough fast enough. I'm just trying to get an overall view. I know we've met on this before, but we've set aside 25 million for this is the entire path to recovery or just this um, first phase that we're talking about, the temporary housing. So yes, we're, these three projects are focused on those first three steps, but we're, this won't take or invest the entire 25 million, plus we have some additional like home <coughs> coronavirus dollars that we're gonna put towards addressing homelessness too. So there will be additional projects coming to council in the future, so this is the start. Okay, okay. Uh, so and just this portion of the East Valley Men's um, Shelter, adding those rooms, and the capital costs. You're doing a feasibility study and making sure it all makes sense mm -hmm. and such. On the expenditure of using our ARPA dollars, are we in line and being, isn't it 24 is our deadline or does it just has to be encumbered or? Right, yes, it has to be um, allocated by the end of 2024 okay. and then actually spent or invested by the end of 2026. Yeah, we hope our much further Okay. Along, but we should yes. be fine. Okay, okay, great. And I look forward to working on this entire model. It's urgent and we need to increase our inventory of, of what we can do to serve our um, people who, through the evictions and all the conversations we've had this past week. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. I just want to add my endorsement as well. It's, it's really uh, rewarding to see how this issue has re evolved over the last few years. And so I want to thank Natalie and, and Mike Hughes and everyone in the room that is really uh, Played a critical role in in um, elevating this issue in our community. Uh, I'm excited that we have a 24/7 hotline. I want. I'm, I'm sure I'm not nearly as excited as Aaron Rains is uh, <laughs> because he is the 24. He has been the 24-hour hotline for a, a few years now. So thank you, Aaron. I'm sorry you're, you're being displaced in that. Um, this presentation started with a, with a great plan, uh, the, the, the Mesa Housing Path to Recovery. It is a, a, a great plan, but we've all acknowledged along the way that mm -hmm. some parts of that plan are more developed than others. And uh, it's a great plan that some, and to some extent doesn't exist and isn't functioning. And so this is a great opportunity for us to use these one-time federal dollars to, to make the investments to, for that plan to become a, a reality. Uh, I do appreciate and, and uh, the fact that this needs to, we want this all to be a regional uh, response. And, and I, I am very proud that MAG for the first time has uh, acknowledged that they, they have a role to play here, not just transportation planning, but homelessness is another issue that's, that's tailor-made for, for MAG. And so MAG for the first time really just uh, for the last several months has been going through analyzing what that plan ought to look like at a, at a regional level and, and, and about a month or so ago, maybe two, launched, uh, announced the Pathways Home Plan, which was a un <coughs> unanimous vote at MAG to, to, to allocate regional monies and, and leadership uh, to acknowledge again the obvious that homelessness is not, should not be dealt with in silos within Maricopa County. So, so that's uh, real progress. Uh, I'm also, uh, it, it, it's fun to see that uh, Mesa Council College has now become the Education and Workforce Development Office. So, so that's not a, a negative thing. That's a positive thing. We're, we, we're continuing to see evolution and, and progress there. So uh, lots to like about this. And I just want to again add my thanks and, and my endorsement to, to what's been presented this morning. Council, any other questions or comments on this item? 
So that's a, that's a big nod, Natalie. All right, thank All right. you. I'll take it. Thank you. <laughs> Next item on our agenda, item 1D, is the presentation. I'm sorry. Next item is one dia a presentation to provide direction <coughs> on the renovation of the Mesa Family Advocacy Center. Good morning again, Mayor and Council. Um, I brought along a couple of friends with me this morning to help me out. We have a project we'd like to bring forward on the January 24th agenda, and we wanted to update you on it and uh, let you know what we're, we, we want to do here. And if you're okay with it, then we'll proceed ahead. So this morning I have with me to my far left is Shelly. Shelly Ward is our victim service administrator for the Mesa Family Advocacy Center. And of course, I think you all know Chief Lee Rankin to my left. Um, Good morning. We're gonna talk quite a, uh, there's really this building um, is uh, going on 35 years old. And so there's a couple of needs here. One is just it needs a major infrastructure overhaul, but there are also functionality needs. I'm gonna talk to you about the infrastructure. Um, Chief and uh, Shelley are gonna talk to you about the functionality needs in the building. The building is very unique. It's a very unique building in our, in our inventory of buildings for what it does. It provides support to victims of sexual and domestic violence. And it, has a, it plays a very um, key role in how they provide services to our community. Um, so with that, um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the facility. It's actually two buildings um, located on First Street. Uh, building B is on your left, building A is on your right. Um, Chief Franken's gonna talk about uh, building A and uh, Shelly's gonna pick it up there and take it into building B when we get into the functionality portion. This building's gone on 35 years old and it's never had a major upgrade. Every single system in this building needs to be touched, fixed, renovated. It started out as a heating and ventilation project. Um, when we got into the building, we found there was no distribution, there's no ductwork in the building. So we've basically gotta take all the ceilings and lights and sprinklers down to go and install the HVAC. So when we're looking at the building, we realized that we needed a lot more work here. And while we're in there, we're gonna be, you know, we're gonna be looking at um, a variety of different things. These two buildings are about 33,000 square feet. Um, they were built in 88 by a private developer. The 80s were a time of significant growth for Mesa and we see very interesting things in buildings built in the 80s that don't conform to code today. Um, back when uh, the city began to adopt the family advocacy model in the late 90s, PD transitioned into the building in 97 under a lease and over time, as the private sector moved out, we purchased the building in 2002 and they've been there ever since. The original, it's still in the original layout. It's kind of a warren of small offices and oddly shaped offices that really aren't meeting the needs of our staff in the building. There's currently, I think about 90 staff members in the building plus <coughs> because of what they do in the support of victims, there are outside agencies that work in the building with our staff. And Shelly's gonna be visiting with you a little bit about that. Just starting with the infrastructure, um, you can see the pictures. We have very old, tired fluorescent lighting. The ceilings are stained, the roof has been leaking. Um, the HVAC does not provide an acceptable level of air quality. We've got code issues, exposed wires. Um, it's really a full menu or, uh, of uh, infrastructure that we need to replace. There are also uh, code issues, ADA, uh, accessibility issues. And then again, it's like, it's just this warren of walls and small offices. We need to expand the spaces and make those more warm, inviting, compassionate, and <coughs> usable for the staff. So those are the bigger ticket infrastructure needs that we need in the building. To do most of this work, we're gonna temporarily re relocate some of the staff in the building so we can just get in and strip the building down if you're okay with that and move forward with the renovations. So I'm gonna go through a series of floor plans with you. There's two buildings, two floors each, and they're gonna uh, walk you through what we do with the building. But when you look at these graphics, if you look at the little red dashed lines, those are the walls that exist today. We'll be taking those walls down and then the rest of the graphics are color coded by use so you can see what the new 
new building would, would look like. All right, good morning, Mayor, Vice Mayor, Council. Uh, first, I want to thank the, uh, the council for the opportunity to be here today to discuss these uh, remodel opportunities. As best stated, that our officers, our detectives, and other professional staff have been in that building for uh, approximately 26 years now. And these two buildings really represent the heart of criminal investigations for the city of Mesa. Some of the most heinous crimes are investigated by our most experienced detectives within these buildings. The purpose of these recommendations is to improve the workspace for officers and professional staff, like I said, who have occupied this building for over 26 years now. So the floor plan you're looking at now houses our uh, a couple different units, uh, digital forensics, and they're responsible for the individuals that investigate internet crimes against children. We also have the heat unit, which is responsible for human exploitation and trafficking investigations, as well as the SONET, which is the sex offender notification and enforcement tracking unit. So Beth already mentioned uh, what the uh, red lines represent. That's really the removal of some of those walls that were really intended to facilitate the medical offices that were there prior to us occupying the building. So we, when you look at the common area, the common area will be used for training and also as a multi-purpose room uh, for uh, multidisciplinary groups that will meet monthly to ensure that they're working in unison uh, towards uh, mission accomplishment. We've also eliminated numerous small extra break rooms to create a larger space uh, to include a kitchen and, a, and ultimately a space for a gym. So since our folks are there on site, that they would also have the equipment need to remain not only mentally but physically healthy. Uh, SONET, we've expanded each of their offices to ensure that they have the room necessary for the modern equipment they need to be successful. It also equalizes the space within those units. Uh, the digital forensics unit, those that work with the, uh, um, uh, uh, the ICAC or the Internet Crimes Against Children, again, they have uh, created uh, equal spaces for their officers. In addition to that, the layout also includes a quiet room, and the quiet room allows those detectives and prefer professional staff to take a uh, mental break from what they're being exposed to so that they could get back to the work of uh, uh, ensuring uh, justice is served. And then the supervisor's office uh, has, uh, uh, supervisor's office have also been created and expanded. Uh, most of the furnishings in there is what we like to refer to a Barney Miller uh, furniture. So as I look at the council, I think everyone gets a reference. Um, that'll be uh, <laughs> maybe one or two. <laughs> you can watch Nick at night and you'll see the reruns. <laughs> that will be replaced by uh, modular furniture. So on floor two of the same building, building A, uh, we have uh, homicide, our financial crimes unit, and then the medical suite. Uh, the changes and again, the removal of some of those walls that were specific to the medical facility have been removed. Uh, financial crimes, we have a more of an open uh, space concept and it provides them for greater work for collaboration. It also expands the medical suites to meet our needs today versus the needs that were um, previously existed. There's a, a larger conference room, again, allowing for increased collaboration among our staff. We've also expanded the uh, cold case unit. We're bringing uh, volunteers into that unit uh, to help us uh, really tackle the number of cold cases, homicide cold cases that exists today. So the expansion of that unit would allow those volunteers to be on premise and work hand in hand with our detectives. And then ultimately, uh, there's a lot of diagonal walls that exist within that facility, which really kind of break up the flow of uh, the second floor. So those diagonal walls, which really serve no purpose for us, will also be removed. 
So also on the second floor is our medical suite. Um, to get an understanding of what we do at the Mesa Family Advocacy Center, we're a multidisciplinary team that investigates and supports victims of sex crimes and domestic violence crimes. As part of that investigation, there are times when uh, examinations are needed of those individuals. Um, forensic collection of, of evidence needs to happen. So we partner with Honor Health uh, to provide those uh, sex assault nurse examiners at our facility in our medical suite so that they can provide not only the, the collection of that, that data, but also to provide medical assistance uh, to those uh, individuals who present at our facility. So those would be individuals um, who've reported a sexual assault or individuals who've reported a strangulation. So uh, that's up, up on the second floor as well. That's our medical suite. Um, on the first floor, First floor, thank you. So our first floor is, is our, where our lobby area is. Um, it's also gonna be an area where our missing persons uh, investigators are going to be, as well as my victim services staff. Our lobby area is sort of the, the face plate of, of, of the Mesa Family Advocacy Center. The whole purpose of an advocacy center is you want a one-stop shop uh, for that individual to come, to feel safe, to receive the supportive services that they need. And we don't want it to, it can't look like a police station. That can be very intimidating for someone who needs to report uh, something very traumatic that's happened to them. Imagine speaking in front of a bunch of strangers to, the, to tell them about a traumatic event or violation that you've occurred. We don't want that to happen in a sterile environment. We want it to be very welcoming. So. Uh, with this new plan, we've expanded the office spaces uh, that, that currently exist. As we've uh, as been previously stated, there are a lot of weird diagonal walls and warrens. Uh, we also partner with Santan Behavioral Health to provide us with a, a counselor. Um, and what we would like to do is separate the counseling office uh, from the sort of the rest of the center. We really want when the person uh, comes and, and has that, uh, that opportunity to make that disclosure, we want to be able to provide those counseling services, but we don't want them to walk through the same door. So we would like to have a, a, a different entrance for them. We would also like to uh, have the potential for expansion uh, to provide additional interviews. We want to make sure that adults uh, can be separated from children. Uh, currently, we have a single lobby, and so if there is a, a child there for an exam, it may be very troubling for them to have an adult sitting in the, the existing lobby area who may have uh, experienced some trauma. So this gives us a better, it gives us a better flow. Um, again, it, it uh, ensures that we are able to provide that service delivery. We also have our playroom or our sort of uh, quiet, quiet room, I, I would say, uh, in that area where we can have individuals uh, wait until we can perform, until the interviews and, and other services can be performed. Thank you. Mr. Thompson has a question. Oh. Uh, and I'm kind of bouncing between the slides of the layout. <clears throat> um, sorry. I'm wondering why, when, when I look at the layout, it, and I, I love the, the concept and the idea, I think definitely we need to uh, remodel and uh, make some changes. But looking at like the medical um, suite, why would that not be um, put in building B with victim services and, and uh, SVU, because um, that seems like that would be um, more often where the medical would be used versus over with homicide and financial crimes. Is it just a space issue? Is that what it boils down to? Yes. Because my thought is if you had everything in building B that was associated with that crime instead of walking between buildings and and everything else. So, so uh, Mayor Councilmember Thompson, it is a space issue. Um, if you look at the floor plans, Building B is much larger than Building A. It's also where the suite is today, so we have plumbing and other things that we need in that area. But this connect, I mean, it's separate, but there's some there's a connectivity connections on that the second breeze, floor, right? Correct. Yeah. Yes. Ready for second floor? Uh, on the second floor, that's where uh, all of the SVU detectives, uh, the analysts, 
as well as our partners, uh, OCWI, uh, would, would be. We have an uh, area for conferencing, so when we do our briefings, uh, as cases come in, we have a briefing with all involved uh, parties, the assigned detective, and all the agencies that will uh, take part in that investigation and support. Uh, and so we meet to discuss those cases and do case reviews uh, in those areas. So it, it brings everyone together, it flows a lot better, and it reapportions the offices uh, so that they make uh, more sense, honestly. So I'm going to just wrap it up with our project costs. I uh, used one of our terminologies there, FF&E. That's generally furniture, fixtures, and equipment, uh, just to help you understand that. We're looking at about a $6.9 million project um, with uh, existing capital funding on the order of $2.9 million and a public safety sales tax uh, contribution of about $4 million. Um, one of the things you're seeing in these costs are just not just the change in scope that we're proposing, but you're also seeing significant inflation in the construction industry today, which um, kicked off in about March of 2020. Uh, between supply chains and the rising cost of skilled labor, and then just materials in general, um, ductwork <coughs> last year doubled in price um, just over the last year. This project's seen about a 35% increase in inflation. So some of these numbers include that inflation that we're seeing on projects as well. So Mayor and Council, just thank you, Beth. That was very helpful. So both included in here is um, just in co construction inflation, but also once we kind of started peeling things back and just realized, listen, uh, this is going to take a lot more to the point where um, we're relocating all the staff out of these facilities. We can't do it with the staff in there. So that, that's also creating other costs, right, where we have to go um, get those um, spaces available so we can have the staff temporarily located there. Um, what's new in here, I really, other than just the idea you're, this contract's coming to council um, uh, soon, I just wanted you to be aware what's new here is because of both the cost of inflation, construction cost of inflation, as Beth just mentioned, increasing. Um, and then obviously we're uh, taking on more spaces to remodel. Um, we are proposing to t use four, uh, allocate $4 million out of public safety sales tax. Initially, we had tried to split that up a little bit between public safety sales tax and some ARPA dollars. But we are so far down the road with the design and the selection of the contractor we didn't want to have to stop and restart the project again because we would have had, if we were going to use federal funds, right? We'd have to use a whole new process. Um, and we just understanding how, again, costs are not, it's not getting cheaper in the future to build something. So we felt like it was better to keep moving forward. And um, because of the improvement, obviously, in the economy and the sales tax, we have, certainly we have enough capacity within the public safety sales tax. Um, and we think this fits very well within that intent to support public safety. So I just wanted you to be aware of it. So we're matching the uh, $2.9 million in CIP funding, but the additional $4 million will be coming from the public safety sales tax. Very good. Thank you. Other questions or concerns? Mr. Heredia. Oh, perfect. <clears throat> On the services, uh, I know we've talked of thinking future uh, uh, establishing a domestic violence core. Uh, does this help kind of add capacity on that issue as far as revamping our victim services unit to help? I don't know if it adds capacity, if we establish a core, are we thinking about that in the, uh, I think look so, at? I think it helps support the services <laughs> support. that are being provided here. If we can set that up on the court side, uh -huh. right? It'll create the efficiency and the specialization over there. I huh. think Shelly and her staff are already handling those cases today. Yes, that, yes. That's fair. Yeah. And, and that and that all goes to another thing. I mean, Council, we've really rethought that. I even had Shelly come to my office and I said, Shelly, this is a lot of money. And so even <laughs> I asked the question, it says, we need, this is the time to rethink, is this the right place, right? Is this the right location? Is this the right facility? <laughs> because it's getting to the point where, well, maybe we ought to just go look for something else. And, I mean, Shelly was pretty persuasive, and we kind of went through it, walked it through it, but um, she, she said it before, and I think in this presentation, we want a facility that doesn't look like a law enforcement facility that creates a different kind of environment, but also the proximity to the court, courts, downtown courts, and even obviously PD, 
um, but in a, you know, kind of in this downtown area seems to be supportive. So we committed to sticking to this site and doing all the renovations with what we had in place, which is good and bad, but it obviously created um, some more expenses for us because you saw, you can see the configuration of this, these facilities, but, um, you know, after being there for 25 years, is that what you said? 26. 26 years. Yeah. It, it's time for a major renovation, so. Thank you. Ms. Spilsbury. Oh, I think I just cut nine, but mine's short. <laughs> um, I, I I have been to this building, and so I have seen it firsthand and seen kind of the weird configuration and, and just the, the needs. So I, I'm in full support. And I just wanted to express my appreciation to how you speak about these people and these victims and the respect that you show them and um, just really... It's, it's beautiful to hear that you that the way you speak about them and, and why this space and what you want to do to it is so important. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. You know, as I look at the architectural rendering on this, I can't believe how you've been able to operate like this. You know, it's, it's ridiculous. That's a good question. We're very, we're very flexible. I mean, this is like an old fire station to me. So, uh, but I've been in the building as well. I was just going to ask a question on the timeline with the design and, and implement the construction and where staff is going to go. Uh, well, I'll have Shelly help me with where staff is going to go, um, Mayor, um, Council Member Freeman. Our timeline is such that if you're okay with this on the 24th, we're packing up people now and getting them ready to go to other locations. Hope to have the contract underway before the 1st of March, and it'll be about a nine-month construction period. So hopefully by the end of the year, we will be moving them all back into shiny new facilities. Um, and maybe you guys can help with the relocations a little bit. Oh, go ahead. Sir. Okay, so uh, we're we are uh, prepared to move uh, the folks uh, from the the center over to uh, the Mesa Center for Higher Education. So we're all packed and and mm -hmm. uh, and ready to go uh, starting the week of the twenty fourth. We'll so be there. You're doing that on the, as That's on specifically the second, second floor, floor <laughs> that we that was not floor. built. So we're we're not touching. We're already obviously we already have Benedictine, and then you have the. Um, Launch point, sorry, uh, <laughs> down in the basement. So this is um, engineering and second floor. Second floor. We've been uh, finishing that out, so that Shelley's folks can move into there. Then after they move out of there and back over to this remodeled area, then we'll be able to move Lee's folks back. Correct. The real time crime center will then move into that space. So we're. Yeah. Doing a little shell game, but at the end of the day, we're making the improvements on the second floor that will be beyond just a temporary um, home for uh, Shelley's folks, but it will then, then convert to a long-term um, location for, for PD, so. Sorry, sorry to jump in real quick, Mark, sorry. Um, on the medical piece, yes. where will you move the medical piece to? Because I know that's an important component yes. of the SVU and, and the it, crimes. It is. Uh, we actually, at our, our medical suite, uh, we, there are, uh, Honor Health performs about 351 uh, SANE exams, and that includes strangulation and, and sex assault exams every year. Um, we are partnering, we, we have a contingency plan to partner with uh, the, some of the other regional uh, or other, I won't say regional, other uh, child and family advocacy centers in order to do our interviews and in order to do our sex assault examinations. So we are uh, working with Chandler, Scottsdale, uh, and some other agencies in, in order to facilitate that. So those are agencies that currently do have those medical facilities. So the only change will be that we will route folks uh, to that location or transport folks to those locations because that's where the nurses will be. So, so it'll be inconvenient that. as far as yeah. proximity Correct. for a period of time. And I guess that was my concern is the, you know, for the victims, <laughs> you know, yeah. we really would love to be able to take care of them yeah. in one location, and that was my concern. But it's a pretty specialized space. Correct. Medical center. So we is, just, the, is there opportunities maybe to utilize um, Banner or one of the one of the units close by where we wouldn't have that's the not an ideal location for for this to for this to happen on a regular basis okay. because those other facilities for instance Chandler they have a nurse that's there um, we can we can transport the individual there the having it at a hospital just isn't um, it's just not ideal well um, I imagine right now with with all the, the pandemic, other things going I can't on, imagine you put in it. Correct. So. 
We'll, yeah. we'll get there, get them out back as yeah. quickly as we it's can. It's the waiting. They, at, at a hospital, we, we couldn't uh, secure to, you know, for, for the purposes of doing a forensic exam, we wouldn't be able to secure and make sure that, that you know, the, the, the personnel is there and available at all of the odd times that we might need them. And that, of course, is gonna extend the wait time for that individual to get that exam. And what we want to do, we realize this is going to be um, a, a bit of an inconvenience, uh, but that's why we, on the, on the front end, need to make sure that we are providing those reassurances, explaining what the process is going to look like, um, and again, partnering with those, those other agencies like Chandler's FAC, Scottsdale's FAC, uh, to, to ensure that we really have that seamless transition uh, for the victims for this short period of time. Mr. Luna. Uh, thank you, Shelley. I, um, I think I visited the facility eight years ago. Yes, you did. And uh, <laughs> it was tired looking then. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> and there may have been a few hints here and there. Hey, we could do some remodeling. So absolutely, I'm in total support of this uh, because, you know, you can understand the important work that you do. Uh, it, it's a tough job. And you need to have a facility that's, that's conducive to, to supporting these families and these victims as they go through that trauma. So thank you for what you do. Thank you, Chief, for what you do, and Beth. Yes. But we really do need to do this, and this is a, a great way of spending money. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Vice Mayor. Yes. It sounds like we've already selected a construction company. I mean, how far along, how, if you're moving, I assume that you're ready to put the shovel in the ground or, or do, clean out the walls or break down the walls, the yes. interior. Uh, Mayor, uh, Vice Mayor, yes, we are. Uh, we have already got a CMAR on board, um, a construction manager at risk, and that's what we'll be we'll bring to you on the 24th is their guaranteed maximum price for their contract. They confirmed with us this last week. We, we get notified by our contractors almost the first of every month that we're experiencing cost increases on our subcontractors, but they did confirm with us this last week and checked with all their subs, so we need them to get their subcontractors tied down and under contract and get moving now. So we are prepared. As soon as we get everybody moved out and we get the bonds and the insurance, the contract signed, um, we're gonna go. Okay, I just wanna make sure we're moving quickly. We're we not know. displacing everybody while we're waiting. Uh, we're trying to no. time it up just. Yes, like, yeah. and the, is, there's really a couple reasons to move quickly. One is um, not displacing people, but the other is just the cost of construction. Mm -hmm. I can't tell you how many it's every day I'm dealing with increases in, in cost of construction. But we also had to have the space for them to move into. Yes. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. just getting wrapped up, Brian. Uh, 18th. Yeah. yeah, so we're, it's all this yeah. Yeah. timing we have to go through. And will the construction be like a year or less? Nine months. Nine months. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> contractor. Okay. okay, thank you. Go contractor. <laughs> <laughs> we want to get done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thank you very much. Any other comments on this? Uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to up, uh, upstage David, but I remember oh, touring God. this move, this building 27 years ago. I, coincidentally, I was on the council in 1998. I thought you might be. And, and even then, it was like, oh, oh great location, God. but this is obviously not built to do what we're. <laughs> Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this, this, I enjoy going into city facilities, and uh, it's a testament to the frugality of our organization, right? I mean, every, we, we all, this building, what happens there and the, the people who work there are amazing, but the building has always been uh, rough, you know, very not, not appropriate. So I, it, this is long overdue. That's right. <laughs> so uh, obviously, I'm, I'm a big thumbs up as well. So thank you to everyone who's made this happen. And I, and I agree with Mr. Brady's assessment. Uh, do, I, I appreciate that we're asking the question, wow, this is expensive. Should we do this or look for something else? This is a strategic location. I think uh, the, the city's lucky to have this, this building and this facility in it, and it is worth the investment to, to remodel it. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next item on our agenda, uh, item two, is meetings and conferences attended. Council members, anything you'd like to share with us? Mr. Luna. Uh, I think it was Tuesday we had the PASPA event, right? PASPA right. event. So I had the opportunity to speak uh, live on Telemundo uh, to encourage our Spanish-speaking community to come to the PASPA event. Hopefully, uh, we had a good turnout. Uh, I wasn't able to actually go to the event, but I was able to speak on uh, Telemundo. So. I want to thank Antonia and I thank uh, Ana uh, Pereira for, for working that out with Telemundo, so I appreciate that. 
Also, I attended my first uh, information technology committee meeting yesterday with the National League of Cities uh, to plan out the year. So here we go. Great. Who's next? Mr. Freeman. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, this Sunday is the annual Fallen Fire Firefighter Service Memorial at the Wesley Bowen Plaza. Starts at 10 a.m. and Captain Trevor Madrid will be placed, be honored and his name placed at the memorial. So I, I plan to attend that. And then our point in time is January 25th from 0500 till noon. Great. Great. Anything else, Vice Mayor? I'd just like to add to, as a reminder that we uh, Monday is Martin Luther King Day and we have a parade and festival in downtown Mesa starting at 11 o'clock going through 4 o'clock. There's a lot to do and to celebrate this day and uh, so please come down and join us. Thank you for that reminder. I think there's a, usually a, a walk in Phoenix but this is really the only MLK parade so uh, I hope people uh, come out and celebrate. Ms. Pillsbury. I'll just add, it was kind of already mentioned previously, but we had our FAFSA event um, in partnership with Mace Public Schools. And um, just a reminder that there's always people to help with FAFSA. So at every single school, every high school has people that can help you too. You don't have to come to this event. And the help is out there to get that, um, that aid for school. Thank you. Council, anything else you'd like to share with us? If not, Mr. Brady, what does our uh, future meeting schedule look like? Uh, we will see Mary Council. We'll see you next Thursday, January 20th at 7.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you very much. Is there a motion to adjourn? Thank you, Mr. Freeman and Ms. Billsbury. All in favor, please say aye. 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 We are adjourned. Aye.